with Rob Zabel this evening to conclude our yoga day before our closing performance with DJ Drez and Marty Nico. Rob, we'd love to welcome you to yoga day. Thank you very much. Uh, is my volume level good? Yeah. We can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So today, well, I guess I'm supposed to start by introducing myself, of course. So uh, my name is Rob Zabel, a graduate of the uh, master's program, obviously, here at LMU. Um, I am also a yoga instructor in the Los Angeles area, and I especially uh, like to work in teacher trainings and sort of teaching, especially the philosophy behind yoga, especially um, one of the reasons behind giving this particular presentation is a lot of yoga practice in the West today is very much fused with different concepts of New Age religion. And although it's definitely wonderful to see people experimenting with yoga in all these ways, we also have to do our best to respect the roots of yoga. And so uh, I really feel that understanding Sankhya, this philosophy we're going to go over, is central to really approaching yoga in its proper, or not proper per se, but in one of its most uh, classical contexts and allowing that context, whether or not it's something that really resonates with you, allowing it to form, inform whatever approaches we have going forward as yoga teachers or practitioners. So that said, let's uh, put up our screen share here. Ah, Sankhya. So <clears throat> just to start with, this word Sankhya, if you've never seen it before, this uh, part Kya refers to counting or enumerating. And so, Rob, just yes. for a moment, um, all we see is a blank screen. Oh, well, that's not good. Uh, how, you want, just uh, um, stop sharing and then sure. select it again. Okay, let's try that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, please. Let me know if things don't work. How about now? I might just need to take it out of the full screen. No, oh, it looks it? great now. Oh, good. And still, still works. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so this part right here, kya, means enumerating, counting, and it's really at the essence of what Samkhya is as a system here. Uh, so of course, we title this presentation, The Enumeration or the Counting of Reality. And so Sankhya is just one of six classical philosophies known as the Astikas. This root Asti means it is. So there are six sort of orthodox and said in most contexts to be theistic, that being what Asti refers to, it is. Uh, viewpoints of the world. Uh, they're also called the darshanas, and darshana from the root drish means to see. Um, and these are all considered orthodox to the Vedas, as in these all take inspiration from the Vedic texts, uh, a lot of them in particular from the Upanishads, which is where we first encounter Sankhya, Vedanta, and yoga, classically. And um, one thing that's worth noting is these schools are all actually paired off. So Sankhya and Yoga are considered connected schools. So the Sankhya school says, this is everything in the universe. These are all the little aspects that make up reality called tattvas. Tat meaning that, twa meaning this, essence. So all these little elements or essences that make up the universe. And in Sankhya, and this is argued by some scholars, the whole goal is uh, what the Gita refers to as jnana yoga, is just to know the metaphysical underpinnings of the universe, and through that knowledge, enlightenment comes. Yoga, based off of the uh, school of Sankhya, essentially says we take that knowledge and we use it in very specific practices to sort of help us realize the reality that Sankhya explains. And we'll get more in depth on Sankhya and yoga in a minute. Then less important for our purposes today, but very important otherwise, Nyaya is the school of logic. Um, Vaisheshika is the school of empiricism, the first uh, 
arguably the first philosophical school to argue the idea of an atom, of sort of a smallest unit of matter. And because of that, they have their own sort of breakdown of the elements that make up the universe, distinct from Sankhya school. And then uh, Mamamsa and Vedanta are paired schools, sometimes called um, Purva Mamamsa, the old or previous Mamamsa, and Uttara Mamamsa, meaning the newer or later or higher Mamamsa. So uh, Mamamsa is essentially the explanation for the rituals that I'm sure a lot of us as yoga teachers are the most removed from, which are the traditional sacrificial rituals and technologies used uh, by the Vedic priests, the Brahmins. And then Vedanta is largely the school that says, hey, you know, I don't think the sacrifice is so necessary. It's more about introspection and mystical interpretations of the texts rather than ritualism. And that's sort of just a big, real quick exposure to the classical schools that came out of the Vedas. And it's important to remember that right now there is not such a thing as a school of Sankhya. So if you go to India and you say, I want to meet a great Sankhya guru, Sankhya is incorporated into the philosophies of a number of schools that exist today, but very few schools would refer to themselves as Sankhyans, with the possible exception of a, a very recent sage named Hari Harananda Aranya. But that's a, a very recent exception to the rule. So, our school of Sankhya was founded by this sage named Kapila, who may or may not have actually existed. His name can mean ruddy or red. Some interpret it as red-headed, which would certainly be a sight in ancient India. Um, I'm not sure what the best translation is, but uh, he is sometimes said to even be one of the incarnations of the deity Vishnu, especially in the Srimad Bhagavatam, one of the Puranic texts in Vaishnavism. They say that, oh, at one point, Vishnu came down in the form of sage Kapila. And we know very little about Kapila, including if he actually existed. He's mentioned in the... And some of his early thoughts about Sankhya, or the early thoughts about Sankhya, are also to be found in the Upanishads. Um, and he essentially describes this dualist school. And before we get too deep into Sankhya, it's important to remember, first off, that by the end of this presentation, you will not be an expert in Sankhya. We're going to go deep into some of the details, and some of them we're going to leave to avoid getting too lost in the weeds, too dry today. But um, I can definitely recommend some books if you want to go into greater detail on learning about Sankhya. So Sankhya, unlike, um, say, Advaita Vedanta, the non-dualist school that's very popular in the West, um, Sankhya is classically considered a dualist philosophy, which means the whole universe is made up of two primary eh, elements, might not be the right word for it, but two realities or two sort of uh, connected principles that we can call Purusha and Prakriti. And so, um, just to sort of give us a simple breakdown, one thing we can remember about Purusha and Prakriti is they do have some qualities that are sort of reminiscent of yin and yang, in the sense that they are eternally present with one another. One is considered the passive, one is considered the active, one is considered the masculine, and one is considered the feminine. And although the idea of masculine being active in the Chinese traditional system is reversed, uh, the male principle is actually passive and the female active in this system. So the inner witness is sort of our truest nature. Our innermost self is called Purusha. And uh, I believe one sort of fanciful etymology we get for Purusha in uh, one of the Upanishads is Puro Isha, meaning the first deity or the first existent thing. Um, now, Sankhya says that this innermost witness, this consciousness that is sort of the seed of every one individual's experience, 
that actually there are infinite ones of these Purushas. The universe is made up of infinite different individuals. And each of these individuals is an eternal, unchanging consciousness. So that you right now are an eternal, ever-existing consciousness. When your body dies, you're going to reincarnate and that consciousness will come into another form. And it will bring with it a lot of its sensory imprints from the past life in the form of, well, kleshas and other things that we might have time to get into in a little bit. So, uh, Purusha, this inner witness, uh, no two Purushas technically are able to interact. So, when you and me interact, what's actually interacting is your sensory mind is observing certain things that are being created through my experience and my actions in the world. But essentially, you and me never actually directly look at one another. As hard as we try, we are always sort of a soul lost in this universe looking at all the things that exist that are material. But not only are other Purushas ultimately somewhat unseeable to ourself, but even our own innermost self is beyond our five senses or beyond our normal modes of comprehension. So the idea that uh, our true goal as yogis is to uncover, to discern this innermost self can be very challenging when everything we've ever experienced in this world has essentially been through the senses. So trying to find that which cannot be known with the senses, very challenging. So, uh, complementary to Purusha, this eternal inner witness is Prakriti. And Prakriti, essentially, it's often translated as nature. Uh, it's a term you'll also see comes up in linguistics or in, uh, to refer to all the languages that evolve out of Sanskrit, we call them Prakrit. So, uh, this word Pra means outward or forth, like the English uh, preposition pro, like project to throw, to move outward or forth. Uh, and kriti comes from this root kur, which is to do. So it's essentially the outward creation, the emanation of reality. And so while purusha is never changing, is constant, prakriti, the only eternal truth of it is that it is eternally changing. So even though prakriti never truly ceases to exist, prakriti is its very nature is fluctuation, is eternal change. And so a beautiful image we sometimes get is that Purusha is the uh, one who watches while Prakriti is the dancer. So we can think of this whole beautiful um, scene of a dancer and an audience and knowing ourselves as the audience. And of course, in a dark theater, you don't see the people in the seats next to you. You just see Prakriti. You don't see yourself. All you're aware of is this ever-changing fluctuation of the external world. And that's worsened by the fact that our inner experience is eternally fluctuating as well. Chitta vritti, which we'll get to in a moment. So, um, yeah, that's basically the idea of Purusha and Prakriti. And uh, we can remember this somewhat in opposition to some of the most popular ideas to come from the East to the West, which is the Buddhist concept that there is no self, so that everything we're experiencing is actually being experienced by no one, no permanent principle that underlies all this experience. And so in the Buddhist concept of non-self, of anatman, essentially everything in the world is illusory. While Sankhya says the world is not illusory, everything that you see is real, but it is not conscious and it's not permanent. So essentially it's real, but its value is still the same essentially as if it were not real. And then we get a concept for lack of a better term, I use Brahmatman here, a concept that there is a divine soul which is one with your soul, which is the common concept in non-dualist schools where they say that ultimately there aren't multiple Purushas, there aren't multiple witnesses. Your ultimate job is to realize that everyone in this world that you see is actually an expression of yourself, your own consciousness. So these are all very interesting schools and both of them actually come out 
using little bits of the framework of Sankhya, less so in Buddhism, which comes up with its own very complicated metaphysics of Abhidharma. And uh, some might suspect Abhidharma is so complicated because Buddhism doesn't really want you to focus so much on metaphysics. But the yogis, we love our metaphysics. We love to think about how the universe works. So, essentially we can divide the universe again almost like yin and yang. Here we've got consciousness and matter. And you see matter is made up of 24 different principles. That's a lot of different things. And uh, there's certainly a lot of things to wonder about this number 24 that occurs a lot uh, in different cosmologies. So it's important to remember that, um, for example, we have the idea that uh, Vishnu had 24 incarnations, according to some of the texts, that before Lord Buddha incarnated as the Buddha, there were 24 previous Buddhas, although different texts give different numbers. But there's this idea of completion summed up in the number 24. You'll sometimes hear Sankhya uh, summarized as a system of 24 or 25 tattvas or 24 plus 1. So, and then I know right now you're looking at this chart and you're going, whoa, that is so many things. How am I going to remember 25 different principles while I'm trying to meditate? You're right, that would be very difficult to do. So don't worry, we're going to find some little bite-sized pieces of this to help it make sense. So right here, you'll notice we've got Prakriti is the original principle by itself. And we in Greek, classical Greek metaphysics, uh, the philosopher Empedocles said that before there was the universe, the four elements, and at that point, Greek philosophy had four instead of five elements. The four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, at one point existed in perfect equilibrium. And in that perfect equilibrium, there was essentially no forms in the universe. And then just the slightest disturbance, the slight little disturbance in the balance of the four elements set off a chain of actions and reactions that essentially created all the forms in the universe out of different combinations of those four elements. Now, it's a little different. The elements actually come way lower in the cosmology here than they do for the Greeks. But we still have this idea that Prakriti, that the root of creation in its real uh, most basic initial form, does not really have forms. The word we find is alinga, which means without a sign. So a linga means a sign. The classic example, they say, is smoke is the linga of fire. So you can know anumana through reasoning. You can see smoke and go, oh, there's fire. So there's a lot of things we can observe. Oh, I have an ego. Oh, I have all these different principles from certain outward signs. But this deepest, subtlest aspect of created reality is so subtle that we can't actually see it with our senses. No matter how hard we try, we can't even understand it with our intellect. So that's definitely a challenge for us as we're trying to meditate, understanding this first principle. But really, first we're going to examine these three principles that I've sort of outlined here. Buddhi, also known as Mahat, Ahankara, and Manas. So... So these are known as the antakarana, the inner doer, the inner organ. Uh, sometimes the three of these put together are referred to as chitta, a word that technically means consciousness. So um, sort of at the beginning of the formation of our power of perception is this first principle of buddhi. And buddhi is the first most basic concept of being able to differentiate one thing from another. So before we can accept any other principles of reality, before we can start to enumerate what makes up reality, the first thing we have to be able to do uh, is just say, oh, this is one thing and this is another thing. There is a multiplicity of forms. 
And of course, when we're just Purusha, when we're pure consciousness, that part of us doesn't really need to exist. But out of the desire to understand and experience the universe, Prakriti evolves into this principle of buddhi, of trying to discern. And so from that principle of discerning one thing from another, the most basic principle of discernment evolves into ahamkara, which means the ego. So as soon as we say, oh, there's this and that, we can say, oh, there's me and there's not me. There's a difference between my understanding of a self and a non-self. And uh, in the non-dualist schools, they really like to emphasize this idea that this ego is an illusion, that it isn't actually real, but it's a principle that allows us to experience and understand the also in those systems on real universe. For us in Sankhya and in yoga, ahamkara is real. It's actually considered material, physical matter, which is sort of different than our classical Western understanding of physical matter. But one way we can think about that is that the ego exists sort of as a result of the formation of individuality. And that on our highest forms, that individuality in some of these systems ceases to exist. But in order to experience a world and anything like otherness, we have to develop this sense of ego, of the self. And then sort of on the most external periphery of our consciousness, of our sense of uh, of our inner organ is the manas. And manas comes from this root word ma meaning to measure. Uh, You can see it also comes up in the word for uh, logical inference, anumana, means it follows from observation or from measurement, um, which is one of the valid forms of knowledge in Sankhya and yoga, anumana, logic. But manas is the sensory mind, is one way to think of it. And of course, all our attempts to really capture these principles with words will do only so much. (laughs) But manas is um, essentially the part of us that is experiencing each moment. So right now you can find your manas because your manas is the part of you hmm, that is processing that, oh, I can smell something, oh, I can see something, oh, I taste something. It is essentially the repository for our sensory experience. And that can be our sensory experience in this moment our sensory experience in the memory or the imagination. It can be essentially manas is where we experience. Ego is how we say, oh, that experience is me seeing or observing or having a sensory or active experience with this object. And buddhi is the part of you that says, hey, and all of this is multiplicity. All of this is many different things rather than just one thing. And uh, one thing that's interesting is uh, manas is actually summed up in some systems or some takes on Sankhya as being one of our senses. So the beautiful analogy in the Bhagavad Gita, they often describe how the chariot that our main characters ride in the Bhagavad Gita has either six or 11 horses that draw it. And those are equivalent either to the five senses here plus the mind or the five senses and five uh, actions plus the mind. So our experience of the world essentially is this chariot being drawn by these five or six or 11 horses, depending on how you want to count it. So one of the first things we want to do before we go any further is just take a moment and try and experience our manas right now. So let's take a moment, sit up nice and tall, get comfortable or wherever you want to be. Close your eyes and just start to observe your sensory experience. So the Yoga Sutras based on the principles of Sankhya, says that in any given moment, your mind is fluctuating between five different experiences, which essentially, at least four of them, take place within the mind. 
The first experience is correct observation, pramana, again from that same root, manas, ma, to measure. So correct perception, according to yoga, that means anything that you can see directly with your senses. Pratyaksha means directly against the eye, but it can be something you smell, something you taste, you feel, you hear. Just taking a moment, notice how your mind in any given second is probably fluctuating between one or more sensory experiences. And when our mind is not absorbed in this moment in a sensory experience, it might be absorbed in the memory of a sensory experience. So instead of in this exact moment, oh, I smell this, I taste this, you might suddenly be flooded with the memory of, oh, I remember going to a lavender farm and the smell of that lavender. That experience is still something that's uh, playing inside of the chitta, inside of our mind, especially uh, the sensory mind. Even though we're not experiencing that sensory uh, experience in this exact instance. We can also be having a moment of misperception, it's important to remember. So viparyaya, at any given moment, our experience, we could go, do I smell something burning? And oh, no, it was just something else. I imagined I smelled something, but I didn't really. So I actually had a misperception in this moment. One of the many fluctuations where you have a sensory experience that is not based on something actually happening. And then, of course, we can, uh, let's see, memory, imagination. We can also uh, drift into sleep. And I know uh, one of my teachers, uh, Chris Chapel, is watching right now. And I believe he has a slightly different interpretation on this one. But... Uh, to my understanding, when we're in the state of sleep, we're essentially experiencing the dream state. Although I think uh, the other argument is that we could be in dreamless sleep. But uh, if we are having the experience of dreams, we're essentially dreams are composed of a mix of memory and imagination. And every once in a while, little bits of actual sensory experience sneak into our dreams. If anyone's been camping and it starts to rain on you while you're camping and you're asleep, so the water falling on you sometimes can sneak into your dream, things like that happen. Um, but otherwise, we can also be in, um, oh, I'm losing track here. So correct perception, incorrect perception, memory, imagination. Oh, Chris, help me out here. <laughs> Well, essentially, just the important thing is to remember is that at any given moment, our mind is in constant fluctuation between these different states. So I invite you just to close your eyes, observe your thoughts for a few moments. We're just going to pause for about two minutes here and just observe as each thought comes up, just label it, oh, that's a memory. Oh, that was an observation. In this moment, oh, I'm smelling something. And then don't attach to it, don't follow it too long and just... See what the next experience is, including if you fall asleep. Hopefully not. Get lost in a memory or start daydreaming. So. Slowly coming back. So this is one of our most basic ways of just observing the nature of our own mind, is just to sit there and rather than trying to, as a lot of us think of uh, meditation, instead of trying to just stop all thoughts 
we just notice our thoughts for exactly what they are. We notice that our nature, when we're in the mind, is to fluctuate, like a candle in the wind, just sort of going fluttering this way and that. Our, our consciousness is not steady in its natural state. And that's why in yoga we say, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, yoga is the attempt to make our consciousness steady, to resist the mental fluctuations. And so um, before we get too far down that, and I definitely recommend if you want to really know more about that, start reading the Yoga Sutras, especially uh, the first chapter goes very deeply into the concept of Chitta vritti, mental fluctuations. So another thing to remember about the way Prakriti forms is similar to the concept we mentioned with the Greek philosophy of the four elements emanating out and forming everything in the universe. Instead, we have three more basic principles that sort of, we know them as the gunas, the three threads that make up the universe. And according to some historians, Sankhya may have actually taken two different philosophies that existed, including the philosophy of these three gunas and the philosophy of these other tattvas and superimposed them on one another. We don't really know, but it's an interesting concept. So essentially, ego can modify itself into three different forms. So as our sense of self forms, our sense of self wants to know the universe and takes on these different forms and branches out. So you'll notice the formation is sort of a single branch until we reach ego. And then at the point of ego, we have this proliferation of modes of trying to know the universe. And from gross to subtle, we've got this idea of sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic or to use the terminology of the Sankhya Karika, the classical text on Sankhya, Vaikrita, Taijasa, and Bhutadi. Uh, Krita meaning action, Tejas meaning fire, and Bhuta meaning earth or element. So what are these three threads that like a loom can be used, can, mix, can be mixed together if anyone remembers Trinitron televisions where you look really closely and there's three different colors that are added up to make all the other colors your TV might want to display for you. The universe is made up of these three energies when they're recognized to be manifestations of the mind. So we've got sattva, which can be seen as the energy of balance, illumination, clarity. And as yogis, one of the things we try to do is cultivate sattva. And sattva can show up in eating correctly, in correct mindset. There's a number of places where we can try to cultivate sattva as yogis. And we have rajas and tamas, sometimes sort of pictured as opposite ends of a spectrum with sattva representing balance in between the two. Not always, but one way to think of it. Rajas is activity, it's also passion, it's motion, while tamas is heaviness, inertia, and darkness. And they say in our original state as a human being, we exist in that tamas, and our goal is to first cultivate a passion, cultivate some motion, some energy, and work our way towards sattva. So rajas is often seen in that sense as the middle on your way to sattva. But in many ways, sattva can also be seen as a balance. It's not too much of passion. It's not too much inertia. Hmm. And one of the really fun concepts, and I've seen this played with in different ways, but it occurred to me in a different way than how it's uh, been summarized in some texts, is that tamas inertia can represent, these can be the three parts of an atom. So tamas, inertia, is essentially the protons, the weight that holds it together. Um, sattva is the neutrons, the sort of passive, neutral, balanced energy that exists and sort of adds completion. And rajas can be the electrons, the moving energy that's sort of more interactive on the outside. If you don't know atomic physics, just ignore all that. It's just another good, interesting way how we can say, oh, even as a yogi, 
I can take this concept of the three gunas and I can apply this even when I look at the world through the lens of physics. I can see these principles existing very much in modern fields of science. So essentially the ego modifies itself into these three modes. And there's a lot of different charts of Sankhya. I made this one myself to really try and summarize some of the things that some of the charts leave off. Um, so you'll notice that there's a mixing of these elements as they take form. So Ahamkara in its most sattvic, in its most illuminated sense, becomes manas, the sensory mind that we already know of, and the buddhindriyas. So the buddhindriyas are our five powers of observation. From gross to subtle, it's our sense of smell, our sense of taste, our sense of sight, touch, and hearing, or to really act more accurately translate it's our organs with which we do that. So we could argue it's the, the eyes, the skin, and the ears. So if we literally translate the terms from the chart that I gave you all as a handout here, you'll see that that's the more accurate translation. Um, so these, again, are very sattvic. They don't really interact in the world. They don't create they're not so much uh, about action or inertia. They're just sort of about knowing. But that same sattva mixed with a little rajas. So some of our senses are a little more rajasic. We do have an essence of rajas in the buddhindriyas. But more rajasic by far are the karmendriyas. So karma means action. Indriya and it's interesting, this word indriya can also mean sort of deities, these powers or these almost godlike qualities that you possess called these indriyas. You have five organs of action. And this is actually the part of the list you'll see the most variations in. I know, uh, again, my professor Chris Chappell teaches a little variation from the way this chart is given uh, just in reordering. And there's different ways I definitely recommend whatever links you experience between the five, work with those, because not every yogi can agree exactly how to break down Sankhya here. Um, but they are the abilities to essentially procreate, eliminate, move, grasp, and speak. And these are sort of our five powers for interacting with the material world. And those powers have a little bit of sattva in them. And arguably the more subtle of those powers like speaking are more sattvic than the power of say, elimination. And I think we can all agree there's, although it can feel very enlightening to have a good elimination, as some people will point out, uh, there is certainly much more to be learned, much more sattvicness uh, in the action of debate speaking, trying to understand. So, and then a little bit of rajas, very little sattva, according to the Sankhya Karika, it doesn't explicitly, to my memory, mention very much sattva being an aspect of what we call the tanmatras. So the tanmatras are the subtle elements that make up the universe, and they are the most heavy, the most inert which makes them the closest to just what we classically in the West would consider actual physical matter. And so these tanmatras, let's actually pull up the chart here, a little easier to understand if we've got the picture in front of us. So for our sense of smell, there's this subtle quality, the subtle element of aroma. And according to Sankhya, the actual element of earth is made of a condensation, sort of a thickening of the more conscious aspect of aroma. So from the quality of us having, say, an ego, it manifests into this subtle quality of aroma. And that subtle quality of aroma by its existence allows the earth to form, or the element of earth, which, as we'll go into in a moment, is composed primarily of smell. So one of the qualities of the earth element is that it has odor, aroma. And if you go and you really think about it, everything in this world that we can smell arises from the earth. 
whether it's a plant that grew out of the earth, a mineral that came out of the earth, anything you smell in the air in the sky is actually little particles of something much heavier, some matter that you're actually drawing in. Next to rasana, the tongue, this element of flavor forms water. So we say that water has this quality of flavor in it. Uh, similarly, form and light or fire are connected. So just as fire has this quality of illuminating, form and fire are connected. And so without there being a principle of, so if we think about it for a moment, without the principle of form existing, what would fire illuminate? How could fire exist if there weren't something to be illuminated? And this is essentially the if a tree falls in the woods and no one is there to see it argument. <laughs> so if there is nothing to be seen, what can one illuminate? It's essentially if you exist in the complete vacuum of space and you turn on a flashlight, there's nothing for the light beam from your flashlight to bounce off of. It's almost as if that light serves no purpose without actual form for light to correspond to. Similarly, the uh, sense of touch related to our skin is connected to the element of air, and air is naturally in contact with our skin at any moment. If you stop and try to feel your skin, you're feeling the element of air moving across your skin, primarily, among other things. You could certainly feel if there were some fire on your skin, some water or earth, too. <laughs> um, and then the subtlest of these subtle elements is sound. And so sound forms space. And this is an important concept that really gets utilized a lot in some of the tantric traditions as well. This concept that there is a subtle form that sound takes that essentially manifests into, among other things, all the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet and all the principles of the universe which are also worshipped as a series of goddesses that take the form of creation. And remember, physical matter, Prakriti, is considered to be the feminine principle of the universe. So, these subtle elements are the grossest. Karmendriyas, the actions, are the most rajasic, and Buddhendriyas and Manas together are sort of the most subtle. The Mahabuddhas are the Mahabhutas, the great elements, the cl five classical or gross elements are really interesting to think about too because they also have this emanational quality where they go from gross to subtle and the quality of earth, Prithvi, um, is particularly interesting because Prithvi is the goddess earth. And this principle of earth, very similar to what the Tantric summarizes Kundalini, the coiled one, this earth and energy contains everything else in the universe. So all other forms of matter exist in earth. So while we can say the element of space is so subtle that it doesn't really contain anything else, but if we look at the element of air, the air around us right now the atmosphere in the room that you are in is not pure air. It's not 100% air. There is space in between every molecule. Every particle is separated. Even those actual little parts of the molecule are all separated by different fields of electricity and different things. And so essentially we can say that no matter what we look at in the universe, it is pervaded by space. The thickest piece of lead you can find is still more space than actual physical matter. So air again is permeated by space. Fire is permeated by space and air. If we take away air, the fire suffocates and burns up. So fire contains air and space. Water likewise contains the qualities of all those that come before it. It contains light can also contain warmth, but it allows light to move through it. It has those fiery qualities. It contains air, and we all know H2O, <laughs> one of every three molecules in water is literally air in modern physics. Um, so yeah, we have this idea that 
water contains fire, earth, and space. And so earth contains water. No matter how dry the earth is, there's a little quality of water to it, of fire to it, of wind to it, of space to it, which means by extension, there's a little bit of aroma, flavor, form, touch, and sound, and it interacts with the ego, with all these other senses. And essentially, it's the most gross and also complete emanation of nature. So in many forms where, in many forms of yoga and other uh, schools that use these principles, uh, where we're not trying to negate or say, oh, it's not real, we honor Prithvi, the earth, as the goddess of all the forms that we might know. So say, for example, if we're a yogi who doesn't just want to escape reality, escape samsara and just know Purusha, but if we want to actually know some something in this world, if we want to interact and obtain certain things, if we want the pleasures of certain things, we actually emphasize the worship of the goddess quite often in the form of uh, Prithvi or Bhumi, Bhumi Devi. So um, <clears throat> in some of our modern systems, or not so much modern, but those systems that are still in existence, so as I said, Sankhya isn't really practiced by itself as a distinct school very often, uh, if at all, but it is uh, so foundational that it's used in almost all these other systems that evolved from it that we can find, including Tantric Yoga, Hatha Yoga. Um, so just to take a little examination, the five gross elements become very central to a lot of our practices. So here on the left, I've made the uh, diagrams of the five elements as they're classically pictured in Tantra. We've got the four-sided earth element, often yellow in color. Then we've got the water element in the shape of a crescent moon facing up. And the moon has certain connections to the qualities of water. And obviously, anyone who goes surfing or goes to the beach around here in L.A. knows that the moon literally moves the ocean. Then we've got fire, and uh, fire is this upward triangle shape, and it's a familiar shape. If you know, Western esoteric systems also use the upward triangle to symbolize fire. Then uh, for air, we either get the six-pointed star or six points making this hexagon shape. And for space, and there's, there's certain variations you can find in different systems. And then for space, the subtlest of the elements, we get this sort of gray egg shape, often said to be a representative of the lingam, the mark of Shiva. So very interestingly, the Greeks at some point also added a fifth element to their system, uh, generally attributed to the philosopher Plato. And uh, so we also get for some reason, very interesting similarities between what are known as the Platonic solids. So Plato, very interested in math, said that, okay, we've got these five elements and that everything in the universe can be reduced to being made of these five elements. And he said, and if we really play with the math, there's only five perfectly, uh, perfect uh, three-dimensional shapes that we can make with all the same faces and came up with what are called the platonic solids. Some of you might know them. And similar to the concept of the square representing Earth, the four directions, the sense of solidity, of steadfastness, we get the cube. And again, if you were to take a cube and throw it on the Earth, it would just sort of stop rolling and become steady. If we took a ball and threw it, it could keep rolling around. Any of these other shapes have more of a rolliness to them. Water is this rounder shape, the, uh, I believe that's the icosahedron, 20-sided shape. And if you took an icosahedron and rolled it, it would actually really roll around. It has the smooth quality like water. But very interestingly, they use the tetrahedron, this very sharp shape to represent fire. And according to some, the idea was that if you looked closely enough at fire, you could see that it's made up of thousands of tiny little tetrahedrons. This is why it has this quality of sharpness, of penetratingness, because it would literally pierce through the skin, the heat. 
Then we get this uh, idea of the octahedron, I believe it is here. And a really interesting concept of the octahedron, if we were to make this shape transparent or translucent, we could see that opposite of this upward facing triangle, the opposing face would be a downward facing triangle and would actually make that crescent star shape, which again, the six points that represents this element of air. Very interesting, no actual idea why there might be so much overlap, but certainly very interesting that there is. Uh, and then uh, for the fifth element, where we also get this term in English, quintessence, fifth essence, fifth element, this, uh, we get the dodecahedron. And for whatever reason, the Greeks and Romans, I think primarily the Romans, actually had, we still do not know what they were for, but these relics in the shape of dodecahedrons all over the place that we believe were spiritual items, but we still don't know exactly what for. Perhaps it was like the yogis trying to sort of comprehend through symbols this subtle element of space. But of course, this is all just conjecture. It's certainly fun to think about. Now, um, one of the things that comes out of this besides Tantra is also medicine. So the idea of these elements in Sankhya become very, princi very uh, important principles in Ayurveda. And the Greeks have a similar system where they use the five elements. Uh, so for whatever reason, the Greeks use a four season system, attaching four seasons to four bodily fluids, uh, four shapes, four elements. Well, in India and in Ayurveda, we classically will break it down into three seasons and connect it to three sort of qualities in the body called humors. Kapha, which is made, which literally translates to, um, well, it's made of earth and water. I'm forgetting for a moment the term. But uh, we've got pitta, which is bile. We've got vata, which is air. We've got these sort of principles in our body that move. Uh, the Greeks had a similar concept. And one of the beautiful things about this is we really see that this is a system that's taking the mind into account, taking the way we encounter the universe and the experience of the seasons and all these five elements into how it views the universe. Now, um, one of the other things we can see is that Tantra took these five shapes and put them into, anyone recognize these five diagrams right here? So I've borrowed these depictions, I think, from an old Shivananda yoga book. These are depictions of the five lowest chakras in the human body, or the subtle body, we should say. And these actually contain, in most of their classical depictions, pictures of these five five shapes that represent the elements. So at the root of our body, our root chakra, we have the earth element. And you'll notice that we even have a little coiled snake here representing Kundalini, the goddess of the earth element. Then we've got this crescent moon in our water chakra, just a little higher. Uh, fire element in our third chakra in this upward triangle the air element at the heart chakra, and the space element in our throat chakra. And so, sorry, we'll come back to that in a moment, but just sort of to show you what it looks like all put in place, we've got the five elements. And so when we meditate, we can also say, okay, there's these five elements and we can place them in our body. And this is a practice called nyasa, very important practice in yoga, where in order to better understand the principles of the universe, we envision them within our own body, which also helps us to see our body as a microcosmic reflection of the same principles that made the whole universe. So the same principles, the same unfolding or emanation of reality that creates the five elements also creates our body and deposits the five elements and five senses within it. And so when we meditate on the five chakras and go beyond and reach this sixth energetic center, one of the common breakdowns of what's called Agya Chakra, 
is that it's made up of these three aspects, the center representing manas, the sensory mind, and then the two petals representing ego and intellect, ahamkara and buddhi. And so that when we're really trying to completely overcome not just our external experience, but this internally formed sense of self, we have to overcome even the sixth chakra that represents antarkarana, this inner aspect of ourself. So we see that some of the most popular systems of yoga that have reached the West, and we all know the chakras have become hugely popular in the West, actually contains this beautiful seed of this much more complicated philosophy of Sankhya. So, just going back for a moment. So, one of the interesting things is even in much more modern Western metaphysics, we see mystics trying to take these principles, uh, and this is famously from uh, Kepler, who received these approximate measurements of the orbits of the planets. And to try and understand the distance of all the planets, he decided, let's take the platonic solids, the shapes that represent the elements in the way that they unfolded in creation, and let's see the rings of our solar system as layers of creation. So we tried to superimpose the shapes of the platonic solids uh, in ways that they would touch one another in this nesting system to explain why the actual distances of all the planets in our solar system reflected this principle of the five elements. Pretty fun concept, pretty far out stuff especially considering he wasn't working with very accurate measurements of the orbits of the planets, but just shows you that so much of even the early roots of modern Western science come from the same mysticism. So anytime you want to say, oh, no, Ayurveda is based on a mystical system, it's not practical. Remember that the physicians of the West were also very much interested in metaphysics and philosophy to inform their worldview. So again, Ayurveda, we've got this principle of three doshas, kapha, pitta, and vata. Kapha is made up of these elements of earth and water that share a quality of cohesion. We won't spend too much time on this. But this is just a beautiful way to visualize the connections between what you may have learned from your Ayurvedic doctor, especially if you attended uh, one of the talks earlier today, we were getting great Ayurvedic advice. You can see how that we can recognize in our body these principles of earth and water that make certain qualities of how we experience the world, how our body reacts to things. Uh, pitta is uh, our bile, the part of us that fire and water. Yeah, and again, we won't spend too much time on this. Interestingly, just for contrast, we have the Chinese classical elemental system right here which does not have wind or space in it, but instead adds metal and wood. Just sort of to give us a completely different system, but notice how everyone loves this idea of five principles. So in Ayurveda, based on, uh, I believe this is mentioned explicitly in the Sankhya Karika, but I could be wrong. They say that so we can see in matter 10 qualities or 10 pairs of opposite qualities. So one of the simplest things we can do to try and see the universe through this lens is to look at something and say, hey, is it heavy or light? Is it slow or is it sharp or fast? Does it have this quality coldness, which would speak to the earth and water elements? Does it have a quality of heat that might speak more to the fire elements? And these actually can be broken down again by these three principles in our body, vata, pitta, and kapha. And some of these qualities repeat because they overlap, so easier to visualize with a Venn diagram. I wish I could tell you who made this Venn diagram. It's one of the many anonymous sources all over the internet. It's a beautiful way to think of it. Uh, so we're gonna take a moment here and just come back to this tantric visualization of the elements inside of our body. So we're going to close our eyes and just have a quick little meditation here. And we're going to first find our breath. In Sankhya, 
The breath itself is not always really understood to be a unique principle. But the breath, one thing you can notice about the breath is the breath contains the subtler element that comes before it, space. So wind and space also connect to our two senses of touch and hearing. So when we try to really focus on the breath, we have to realize that there's two of our sensory organs that connect to the breath. We can hear it and we can feel it. And if we want to cheat, we can visualize it. We're not really seeing our breath, but we're still using the visual part of our mind when we visualize the movement of the breath. We start to visualize our breath as moving up and down what's known as shushumna, the central channel of the body. And our breath is a little microcosm of the forces of the creation and the reabsorption of the universe. And every inhale, our breath energy descends through of our spine. And every exhale, it reascends past the third eye and out through the nose. Moving energy. As the breath descends, it goes through the five elements, becomes more and more gross, becomes ultimately the earth element at the bottom. And as we exhale, earth dissolves, then water, fire, air, and space back and forth. We can even add at the end of the exhale, ideally, even our mind, our ego, and our intellect start to disappear, start to become at least passive, not active. This might be one of the reasons why in the Yoga Sutras they say that you can exhale and hold the breath to create steadiness of mind. bringing our awareness down to the root chakra, Mula Adhara, the root support. And we visualize this as containing the earth element, which means that when we go into this space, we're going to draw in the power of earth, the qualities of the earth element inside of our body, which also means the subtle quality of aroma, which means your sense of smell. So that part of your mind that is moving outward through the nose starts to draw into our body and rest here in the root chakra. The part of our mind that fluctuates through smell, through aroma, through the memory or imagination of aroma draws inward and becomes steady. Take a deep breath, hold it for a moment. Awareness climbs a little higher. Don't be too worried about where you experience these chakras in your body. Classically, this one is around the root of your genitals. And in this place, we get the qualities of water. The qualities of water in our body, we can feel all these fluids moving. We can taste the water in our mouth, on our tongue, in this moment. And so the sense of taste and the organ of the tongue themselves start to draw inward into the center. The energy that was going outward starts to move inward. We can even add Incorporating a principle from later Tantra, we can incorporate Ketri Mudra. We can just gently press our tongue against the roof of our mouth to represent that instead of the tongue facing outward or downward to taste the forms of the world, it faces upward to try to know the self, as if our tongue is reaching for the deepest recesses of our mind. 
Again, absorbing this water element, our sense of taste. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Moving to our subtler sense of sight. Now, if our eyes are moving around, one thing we do to make the mind steady here, we might use another mudra, borrowing from Tantra. Shambhavi mudra is when we lock our eyes where the eyebrows meet on our third eye point. Maybe we lock on the tip of the nose, but essentially, instead of allowing our eyes to fluctuate, we draw that sense of vision inward. Everything we see in this world, which is also illuminated by the element of fire from the sun, from your light bulbs, from whatever form of fire that may be. We start to draw that power of sight inward. We start to draw that element of fire inward. Take a deep inhale, hold that in. And sigh. We move up then to the heart chakra, anahata. In this place we get the element of air, our subtle element of sensation, our action sense, of grasping and our sense of touch which is associated with the skin twak or twatch so one of the ways we can again draw in from tantra we might make a hand mudra here to represent instead of our fingers reaching out our ten senses through the ten fingers when we connect the fingertips together or even Vajra fists, a technique from Tantric Buddhism, we draw all that inward instead of outward. So we draw our sense of touch in, the element of air. We hold it inward, creating stillness in that part of our mind, of our sensory experience. Take a breath. throat. Coming to Kanta Kupa. Kanta Kupa is the root of our throat here. One of the mudras we might borrow to help create stillness in this place is called Jalandara, where we bring our chin down to the notch in our throat. And this can create stillness here. A little more awareness of the throat space. One of the promises in the Yoga Sutras, the third chapter, is that if we meditate hard enough on the space of the throat, we will become very, very still. So the element of air, space, the subtlest, the hardest to visualize, starts to draw in. The sounds around you start to fade with no space in which to vibrate, to echo. Our sense of hearing starts to draw inward and we might start to listen to the internal sound of our breath as another way to bring that awareness more inward. You guys probably all know this one, ujjayi. It's the sound of our breath vibrating in the throat. That vibration and expression of space right here in the throat. We take a deep breath, we hold it. This chakra is known as Vishuddhi or Vishuddha, meaning purified, 
essentially saying that in our meditations, when we've gone past these five outward, more tamasic and rajasic elements, we've reached a more sattvic place. But remember, right here at our third eye, we get these principles, and there's different ways of viewing it, but again, antarkarana, instead of our outer experience, now we reside in the inner experience. This is where we would say that samskaras, the impressions of past sensory experiences, have sort of made their imprints. This is where a lot of our memories, a lot of the things that shape us live. And so when we reach this point, we're really at a point of introspection. Uh, some might even call this vichara meditation, reflection on chara, on our behavior, or a, uh, subtle reflection, depending on whose interpretation of vichara you want to use here. But at this point, we're not meditating on the world. We're starting to meditate on the power of perception, who it is that sees what the ego is, the sense of self. And these can be some of the subtlest but also most profound meditations. And so when we reside at this point, all we have to do is just ask ourselves, what is this? Is this a sensory thought? Is this me? Is this myself? One of the things that yoga teaches is that our sensory experiences will compel us into these things called kleshas, these um, sort of afflictions that we carry, not just from this life and our sensory experiences here, but from past lives as well. And so that in our meditations, we start to see, oh, I have this experience over and over again because deep down in my ego, I have an attachment to this, raga, or I have a fear or dislike of this. And ultimately, they say the root of all of these is avidya, is the ignorance of our true nature, because we think everything we experience with the five senses is our self, is our true self. The stiller our mind becomes in yoga, they say, the more we experience our inner self, the witness that is unchanging. Take one last breath here. And allow your awareness to come back through our intellect, the ability to tell two things from each other, to the, to the ego, the ability to tell self from other, to manas, the part of us that can see what all these other things are, to our five senses, to our five organs of action, powers of elimination, reproduction, <laughs> moving, grasping, speaking, our five subtle elements, going back all the way to our experience of the five elements as we open our eyes and see again this world made of fire, water, earth, air, space. So uh, just a little example. These meditations on the five uh, elements are very old. Here's an example from the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra. We are almost out of time, so we're not going to read this, but just a beautiful example of a meditation on, instead of five chakras, five regions of the body representing the five elements. And uh, a little excerpt from the Srimad Bhagavatam, also called the Bhagavata Purana, where they say, after completing this Hatha Yoga movement, this piercing of these centers connected with these elements, the yogi essentially, utkranti, can leave their own body through the crown of the head and move through seven worlds, seven sort of heavenly realms, and then we experience our subtle body. And this is really interesting. We move through earthly, watery, fiery, glowing, and airy versions of our subtle body. So we move through subtle versions of these five elements to reach an ethereal body, and eventually we surpass the five subtle senses, and this is already out of our body. This is a description, essentially, of the experience of enlightenment as a journey up to the highest realms of heaven, but again, still reflects these Sankhyan principles. The palate by tasting, seen by forms, vibrations of the ear, and then the devotee, surpassing gross and subtle, enters the plane of ego, and then... Uh, 
goes past the uh, the gunas, the three threads that make up reality, and eventually dissolves themselves into the sattvic version of the ego and into prakriti itself, mahat tattva, another word for prakriti. So just a very interesting thing. Even these yogis who don't, this is from a bhakti tradition, they're not very concerned with meditating on the five elements, but even when they talk about what Prabhupada describes as travel to other planets through our spiritual practice, these same principles come up. And uh, we don't have time to go into it, but also the great exeget um, Abhinava Gupta goes on to explain that, yes, we can even see a non-dual worldview taking these elements, including the Purusha, the inner witness, and we can say that, yes, there is this individual soul, but by virtue of illusion, maya, we're just not realizing that that inner individual soul is just a fraction of Shiva, of actual God consciousness. So just another way that the system gets expanded on. So you can see that in all these different approaches to yoga, to meditation, we have these roots of Sankhya being honored, even just tacitly. So I encourage you to do these five element meditations whenever you can uh, to think about this idea that your mind is constantly in motion and that when we try to understand Prakriti, when we try to understand Purusha, these most unchanging aspects of ourself, the real practice is to create stillness, to withdraw as um, when the Gandhi's favorite quotes from the Bhagavad Gita goes, Yada samharate chayam kormonga niva sarvashaha indriyani indriyarte vyastasya pragya pratishtitaha. The yogi makes themselves reside in steady wisdom, steady insight by withdrawing the five senses as the turtle withdraws its limbs. So just think about that. Next time you sit to meditate, drawing in one by one the five senses and turning our outward consciousness inward, our multiplicity of forms into singularity pointed upward. <laughs>